Thank you so much for that and uh, thank you for ensuring everyone in the audience has woken up. Like you said, this is a post-lunch session and I saw Nathan running up towards the stage so I know he's pumped up and energized to start today's panel discussion. And thank you to the three of you and thank you to the Ascent Foundation for inviting me and for inviting all of us. I'm personally excited to be here. We on the Leaders of Tomorrow speak with entrepreneurs like yourself. So it's really good being here. And thank you once again to our panelists. And I know we're talking digital workforce. So perhaps we start with the definition of what a digital workforce is. And um, you know, if you look at the textbook definition of a digital workforce, it's really talking about automation and an automated workforce. How automation can work closely with human manpower. But that's really not what we're talking about today. We're talking about a workforce that is digital first, that lives in a digital world. So with that in mind, how do you think perhaps uh, things have changed over the past two years, we're talking, we were talking hybrid, we started with talking about remote, we're talking about hybrid, now perhaps most organizations, Meena I know you were saying almost 75 to 80 percent of organizations are back to fully being in office. How have things really changed in the past, uh, you know, sort of year, year and a half? And what is this workforce that we're talking to? How would you define perhaps the changes that have happened in what a digital workforce is? Uh, maybe I could come to you first, Meena. Thank you, Sunanda, and uh, thank you, Ascent, for uh, inviting me. Um, the last about two and a half years, I would say, have been obviously uh, very, very transformative for all of us, uh, for organizations, for leaders, for employees, across the board. It's completely changed our mindsets. Now, there is, of course, the population that was working before um, COVID struck and was in a, in a physical mode and has moved into a hybrid mode. In some con uh, certain industries it's more and some is less. But also there is a workforce which joined work during the COVID time and they have not seen the office ever. So there is that also and those people who have never been, uh, in fact they finished their graduation and they probably studied the last one year at home, started working, so that about a year, two, two and a half years they've been at home, they don't want to go back to office, to be honest. They've sort of become so comfortable. So getting them out and making them come and interact with the rest of the audience and rest of the people in the organization has become a huge challenge for a lot of companies. So there is the pre-COVID people, employees, and then the during COVID employees, they behave very, very differently. The ones that were pre-COVID, are quite happy to come back but uh, of course some of them there also don't want to they're they've moved to their hometowns and they're happy to stay there but the during covid they have a very very different view of the world you raised a very important point i do want to discuss that in detail but uh, i'm sure this audience doesn't need any introduction to meena she's a superstar she's a rock star lots of people walking up asking her for selfies when we were seated here in the hall uh, i don't know about selfies but uh, at uh, the end of about 30 minutes or so we're going to open up the floor for questions any of you have questions for her and our other panelists please keep those questions ready uh, but i want to ask the same question to you as well uh, nathan how has this workforce changed and what is your definition first and foremost of this digital native workforce really? Well, the way I would look at it is where you have um, the technology and you have people and people using technologies with such ease both at work and off work, that's a digital workforce. I mean, you don't really make a big distinction out there. But many things have changed in the last couple of years. So this is a question to people in the audience. How many of you have seen The Devil Wear, Wears Prada? Excellent. So I'm going to take you on to the first scene of that particular movie. So there is Anne Hathaway. She goes in Manhattan. You see this big edifice of a building. And, and it's very imposing. You're going to work in that office. And she walks in, etc., etc. The last scene where she exits that office is exactly the same thing. There is this huge edifice, looks at it like that and walks away. Uh, just borrowing on the theme that uh, Meena was about, we've had people who joined an organization, left the organization, never even seen the front edifice of a building of that organization. All they have seen is a laptop and a certain identity. 
So the ease with which organizations had transferred, moved, migrated into working from home, getting people to feel empowered. The biggest one that has happened, what I think is the biggest change is, um, look what happened during the time when people didn't have this amount of supervision that we asked of them. It's almost like your manager layer got completely disintermediated. And people still worked on their own. They actually worked harder. In fact, they worked so hard, many of them got burnt out. So the ease with which people have taken on to technology, delivered more, in fact, delivered far more than what organization expected, has been the big one. Second one is organization placed a lot of trust in people. Of course, some people may say, we didn't have a choice. That's the second part. The third one is, how do I, people also felt, how do I get ready for the next wave where nobody is pushing me to learn, I have to learn to survive. So these are three things that has happened in the last couple of years. Fantastic, thank you for those insights. Let me come to you, Ajit. What do you feel really defines this workforce that we're seeing? Yeah, so I think uh, adding to uh, what has been said, uh, what we've also seen is a whole bunch of people who it's not just about the ease which, which they have adopted technology, it is also about their rejection of a whole lot of things which were pre-pandemic considered to be something that you had to do. For example, people are comfortable coming on chat groups, they're comfortable coming on video conferences, but they will not pick up the phone because they're just not used to the office setup of actually meeting and talking to people. Right? And one of the challenges has been to be able to blend all of that into an environment where even as COVID has sort of gone away, some part of the working in office has come back. So, you know, this digital sort of workforce uh, that ease and the compulsion or the compulsion that they have of not wanting to do things in a certain way, not wanting to be based, you know, in an office five days a week. I think all of that defines, in a sense, the hybrid uh, workforce that we're seeing. Okay. Um, and maybe I can ask you this question first, Ajit. Would you feel that you have also perhaps changed in these last two years given just you know the mode of work i know organizations like yours didn't really have the comfort if i can call it that of being able to not go into the office but do you feel that a lot has changed in you as a leader being able to lead this workforce through these changes in in terms of you in terms of change uh, no absolutely i think uh, I think a whole lot of how we've had to work through those two, two, through those years, a uh, couple of years, has meant that things that were taken for granted are no longer taken for granted, right? Um, now, one of the big changes for us as an organization is that when we started off, I think, pre-COVID, we had what we would describe as our head office in Gurgaon, right? because that's where all of the teams were largely centered. That's where a lot of the decision making happened. Two years down the line, we're no longer that company. Uh, our offices in other places have grown because uh, in that era, we, we obviously sort of relaxed a lot of our norms on how and where to recruit people. And today what we have, even in an environment where we've come back to working in office, Largely, we have a much more distributed workforce on the corporate side. Um, given our sector, obviously, you know, we were anywhere distributed workforce from an overall sort of standpoint, but the corporate slash decision making was actually centered in one place. That's now spread across. When you say distributed, do you mean geographically distributed? Geographically, geographically. And much more than what was pre-pandemic? Much more than ever before, much more than ever before. And partly because through the period of, of those two years, um, you know, teams looked at recruitment in a very different way, right? So they were absolutely fine, you know, recruiting people who were based in different cities. They figured out how to work with those teams. So you have even 
let's say small teams of five seven people which otherwise would be a single office team now being spread across four offices so you literally have a five member team based out of four different cities so even if they have to meet it's not as simple as them you know coming for a day to office uh, they actually have to travel very interesting point and let me pick up on that and i think skilling in this post pandemic area is a huge topic of discussion really and uh, I, i would love for all three of you to really give me your thoughts on how perhaps one the workforce has changed because the mode of working has changed but how are organizations like yours hiring differently what are those skill sets and for our entrepreneurs who are here today could you help them understand if they are looking at employees and they are looking at hiring how should they be hiring differently how should they be looking at reskilling and upskilling themselves perhaps and has that changed as well and maybe i can come to you first nathan so <clears throat> I think one of the big things that we got away from was that you have to have a degree or you have to have this certification and all of that. So a, a big one was migration to skills because that's the single biggest use in any organization. Of course, we will all have our own hang-ups that the person must be from this particular university and must have got that grade and so on. But we have realized in the last couple of years that we've got to expand our our ideas about what skills mean to us second one is you don't really hire only for that particular skill because that skill could vanish in no time it could become obsolete so you're really looking at learnability you're looking at things like curiosity you're looking at the person does the person have resilience and last but not the least when you're looking at a, a person is that person somebody who can come on board and say i have to learn this because i feel that there is a certain drive within me and i must learn this because i've got to rise and shine so if i can get those kinds of people and by the way they are rare then that's the way to shoot the other one is uh, for long we have concentrated on a certain kind of people so it's almost like a templatized kind of hiring that we had done in the past those templates have all gone by the side uh the biggest change that has happened since then is we have started to say the templates are in our head you got to move those templates for instance we would not go to a tier 3 city it's a big one another big hang up is unless the person speaks the queen's english king's english then <laughs> then i would not hire this person i think we've got to get rid of those kinds of hang ups because you're really looking at what is it that the other person can do within an organization i think those templates those hang ups we have started to move away from and uh, if you can manage to provide to that individual a certain dream that you can come on board realize your own potentialities and in that short period of 20 30 minutes that you're going to speak to that person then i think you have a good hire meena similar to uh, ajit i do know that uh, the industry that uh, you know you're an entrepreneur in didn't have time to really think when the pandemic was happening because you were amongst the first respondents are you looking at your employee base differently are you hiring differently now have things changed yes we uh, as uh, as a healthcare company never had a single day of work from home as far as our front uh, front uh, forces concerned front line workers who went to people's homes to support them there was no concept of a work from home and you work from their home of course <laughs> but not work from your home not possible also what happened during those periods is that a lot of these uh, people who are doing the work um, the the healthcare work had to take a lot of decisions on their own whether it is about how do i get to some place because the roads are closed or the police is chasing us starting from there to a uh, new kind of uh, health issues that were coming up that nobody knew about with covid wave 2 with sudden deterioration so both from uh, logistics and also from the medical perspective the things that uh, that happened that played out in the during the two waves were so dynamic that we needed people who were able to take very quick decisions 
Also, we found that the whole country was obviously in turmoil and we were working with the, the government at various places to help them to deal with this. And we realized that even the government needs a lot of support from all of us because nobody has all the answers, nobody had the answers. So this whole bit of collaboration suddenly became much more meaningful. Collaboration across um, competition, collaboration across other industry players, the whole medical ecosystem. There is one WhatsApp group that I have which is called A to Z. Every, you name any big healthcare doyen in this country, I have that in my WhatsApp group. Um, because all of us literally came together and tried to solve the problem. So it is a very, very different kind of uh, experience that we went through. Now from there, what are the takeaways? This is not going to continue. I mean, you're not going to collaborate with the, everybody all the time. But what the few things that change, one is of course in terms of the kind of people that we hire, the, will, the, the, the look, we look for less templates but look for more um, a willingness to take uh, ownership end to end for anything, any problem that is there. How do you solve that problem end to end? That is one thing that has changed. Second, teamwork and collaboration. Like you said, Ajit, across the organization, across third parties, with ecosystems, do you have the ability to actually step out of your comfort zone and make those connects with people who you never connected with in the past? Those, I mean, there are many, but I would just call out these two as very critical changes that came about in how we were looking at people. Uh, Ajit, you know, I want to go back to what you were saying in terms of now having a more... Yes. So, uh, you know, you were talking previously about having a more geographically diversified workforce and that while um, during the pre-pandemic period that would have been a challenge, of course, my question is, and you know, because we are talking to an SMB audience, I understand, largely SMB audience, the cost involved. Uh, now that you, a lot of organizations are looking at hybrid, one of the challenges of having a fully in-office workforce is being done away with because you have lower rental costs. What were the biggest challenges and what lessons have we perhaps learned from having a fully in-office workforce to this sort of hybrid model that a lot of organizations follow? So I think the challenges are the known ones, right, which is basically having multiple offices, etc. But I think the advantage in today's world also is a lot of the flexible models, right? So you don't really need to set up an office of your own. You can utilize work, uh, you know, co-working spaces. And I think with the change in sort of uh, the structure of the workforce, I think companies have to be much more open to those kind of changes, right? Um, so I think uh, I think there is a set of challenges that come with that, right? Um, however, I think what we've at least, and we're in the early phase of understanding that very well, which is that, do we believe that we've landed up eventually in a better place overall? We do believe that because uh, I think the density of talent available, right, just becomes much more because, you know, you are more open to taking on board people in different places. Uh, they can operate in different roles. Uh, some of them will end up double hatting, etc. And it's it's a combination of all of the points that I think uh, Svi and Meena was also saying, right? Which is you have people who are more generalists in a sense, problem solvers, thinking from first principles. So even as the workforce has become more distributed, it has also become more diverse in terms of its ability to do different things so you know uh, i think one of these don't work right so these both of these have to go hand in hand in a sense right uh, but i think the part i think that meena was making is very important right which is that in these kind of situations and even more so even in a world where people have come back to office uh, more ownership thinking from first principles is always going to be a lot of value, uh, whatever the situation we get into. Sure. Um, Meena, this question is for you, but I would love for everyone's perspective from this panel. One section, if I can call it that, of the population that has historically been disadvantaged, of course, is the female workforce. Um, publicly available data shows that the female participation in the workforce has 
uh, come down year after year upon year and has stagnated at about 13 odd percent. You look at the ratio of female entrepreneurs to male entrepreneurs; it's at a similar figure, low single, uh, low double digits. And my question is, this section of the population perhaps faced the worst of the pandemic, the brunt of the pandemic, uh, and is perhaps happy to really be back in offices. So. You know, maybe organizations like yours, you can talk us through how leaders are able to also, the, the empathy part that really comes in when you're now working with your employees. Give us examples from your own organization about how that's changing. You're absolutely right. And uh, there were many young women and some very senior leaders in my organization who had young children. Now, it's all very well to say that you get a nanny and the, the toddler will be with the nanny and you work in a different room. No, it doesn't work. And I'm sure any of the mothers in this yeah. room, including yourself, Sunanda, will know that that's not going to happen. Yeah. That toddler will be with you. Yeah. Maybe will be better controlled with a nanny, may not be at times, but you are all in. Okay, you have to. And as leaders, we have to understand that that woman is very capable. She is delivering great for you. But the circumstances are such that she has to probably uh, supervise the child at some points in time and you need to know when and how. I had a lady who had 7 to 8 p.m. She said, I'm just not available because only I can put my child to sleep. She will not do anything else. Fine. There was a male, by the way, uh, one of my colleagues. He said, ma'am, when are you bringing me to office? I just cannot bear it anymore in my at home. Both my children are hanging from both my ears. How do I work? You know, he just doesn't know how to handle it. He's never been at home. Yeah. The children are delighted. <laughs> Father is at home. Catch hold of him. Don't let him go. So it is one is that, that we need as leaders to understand that the situation has changed. Okay, they have to probably look after the little ones. They probably have to supervise school hours. School is going on. You can't put a nanny alongside the child and say, okay, you know, pado. It doesn't work like that. You may need to go and supervise every so often. Perhaps they need regular breaks. They can do some meetings. Maybe they need to work on their own. They need to also have the courage and you need to give them the freedom to say what are the times that work for them and that don't work for them. How are you as an organization willing to work around that? How do you make sure that your meetings and your other colleagues don't constantly impinge upon those blackout times for people. So those were some of the challenges. But now one would argue, do the girls want to come back to work or do they want to stay at home? It's a very tough choice. I would think anybody who has a toddler will probably want to go to office. They don't want to sit there because it's just too <laughs> harrowing, having been through that many moons ago. But those who probably have a fairly well-settled household, uh, maybe grown-up children or children who are self-sufficient and not going to impinge on your time. It's a great thing. I mean, you're in the same space, you can check in on them, they can speak to you. Lovely if you can spend time or if you have elders that you have to supervise, they care of. It's great that you can work from home. It is, it is a divided situation. No, you cannot assume that, oh, women used to struggle with the travel. They don't have to travel. Life sorted for them. They're so happy to be at home. Not true at all. It's a very, very difficult situation. Do you want to add to that? Um, just building on what Meena said, sometimes organizations look at it more from a policy standpoint, what can we do? For instance, talk about the nanny. If you think that you can give a certain bunch of money and say, this is nanny allowance, that doesn't take the pain away of having somebody in the house as a nanny because the child is always going to come back. I think a couple of things organizations across the world have started to do is, for starters, the men in the room have started to be a little more wiser about the challenges that women face. Would you agree? Fantastic. I can say this for one, because when I'm at home and I'm working from home right through the pandemic, anytime the doorbell rang, I had to go answer the doorbell because that was my responsibility. And of course, walk the dog, do this, odd job, this, that. And then we don't realize what it means to cook. We don't realize if there is somebody who doesn't come and sweep the floor, then I know what it is because, of course, just within the confines of these four walls out here, we had to do a lot of this jadu pocha ourselves. I got a little wiser and I said, you know, I'm gonna get a device which can do that for me. 
But back to the point, all what we think are policies and, and a few freebies that you can induce doesn't take away the core of what, what really happens at home. Women have not understood what it is. Women, by the way, I'm, I'm just generalizing. Women take this responsibility, any responsibility, quite seriously. Far more than the men in the room. I'm sorry, guys. And, and therefore, they do not know the meaning of boundaries. So when they start work, they do not know when to end work. So when we bring them in, so for instance, the utilization in organizations ran up by almost 10% during the COVID times. Why? Because people didn't know the boundaries. Earlier, you knew you started with the sun, you ended with the sun. And generally speaking, you started work at let's say nine in the morning, at six in the evening, sundown, you get off, get home. But people didn't know those boundaries. We had to teach people what boundary management is. You start now, you please end at this time. Mercifully, all that that we had as huge utilization and, and consequent burnouts, 86% of the women didn't want to go back into that same job. And we had a Deloitte uh, 22 study that said that it is very difficult for women to go and speak to their managers about some of their mental health issues. And I say mental health, it's not like going into some deep one, but the anxiety that they hold for this. So I think beyond all of this, a certain awareness, bringing in a culture where we understand what are the pain points that people face, being empathetic to their cause, I think that's a great way to start. Um, I, I know this from personal experience, because if you are at home, you're trying to do something, you translate that into a broader canvas. So what does it mean to our employees at work? And then of course you do a lot of these studies with people and then we learn a lot and then go back and say this is how things can pan out. Ajit, to you but also if the two of you would like to jump in on this question and I want to talk about one of the challenges of this hybrid workforce and you know you're talking about geographically diversified is the is the challenges when it comes to data management and data security. And I know every organization faces that. I'm sure every organization here in the audience also perhaps at some point has had that question. How do you ensure that your data is being protected because people are no longer perhaps physically back in offices, um, but you have to ensure that your data is being protected. And it comes at an additional cost as well. Yeah, so I think um, a few things, right, which is that um, anytime you go down, you, you go down a path of basically having uh, having such a change, right? Uh, I think you have to invest behind the change. Right? I think that that you cannot run away from it, right? Uh, so we've had to invest in that change, um, and many a times we've actually not been. And one of the differences of that investment has been that. Unlike in more stable situations, we've had to go ahead investing in a change without knowing how much we're going to invest in it because you have to make it work, right? Um, so that's been a challenge. I don't think, I don't think we, we or any anybody in our sort of situation has a perfect answer to that. Right? Uh, it will depend on the situation, and hence uh, there will be. Uh, there will be things that you will say, uh, you will turn back and say, you cannot do it in a certain way, right? And that's where the flexibility comes in, right? Which is you have to build in the flexibility to say that certain things hence cannot, you know, even though uh, you did it in a certain way during COVID or during, you know, uh, during a time when office working was not happening, you cannot go back to that now. It was a desperate situation. You had to do it in a desperate situation, you will not do it in a normal situation, right? Um, the investment part of it, uh, so to, my, to my view, to me, it, it is always a question of necessity versus, uh, you know, an option, right? Uh, where it is necessary, I think you don't have a choice, right? Uh, and it becomes a part of your cost of doing business, simply like, there is a lot of saving that also comes from some of these decisions, right? So you have to weigh both of those things. Right? Um, 
in our case, I'm just taking a small sort of example, right? Uh, we did realize that, for example, some of the things that we were doing did not actually need to be, need to did, did not really need to have any kind of data security at all. You know, we were overbuilding for it. Right? We realized that this doesn't matter. And in some cases, we realized that actually, no, we have to, even in a sort of COVID situation, get some of these things under a roof and make sure that people are actually brought in to do this so that we maintain the level of you know, security that we need. So it was both extremes, to be honest. And I think both of these will continue. Nathan, do you want to speak to the SMBs here about the increased cost and the increased need for data security and what you wish for them to know? See, everybody talks about how data is the new oil, etc. So, the, the biggest threat that we face is one of the, the cyber threat is the big one. And um, when somebody steals your data, then there is a reputational risk which is at stake. Today, there are such a lot of regulatory pressures which are also brought to bear that organizations are slowly feeling the pinch of the whole thing. There are a couple of things that we ought to be doing within ourselves, and I'm speaking very broadly, just not for the entrepreneurs out here, but for even large organizations. I think we have to be investing a lot more in getting our people sensitized to what it means. So communicating with our people, getting them to understand even simple things like phishing. How do you prevent phishing? How do you make sure that your data is not breached? And even simple things is when do you seek permission to share data? You might almost think that this is so easy. It is not easy. The easy thing is, okay, somebody asks you for that data, you very readily go and give that data. It can happen at that. It, now that's got nothing to do with cyber. But just the security of the data is something. So I would believe two things we ought, we've got to be doing. One, understanding, because the point that Rajiv just made is, it is getting to be expensive, because the platforms are getting expensive. We can also be looking at what is not really high security, so we can move that by the side, look at only the code. But I would focus more on getting our people to be wizened about what security attacks can mean to us and to our business. That can go a very, very long way. We can both contain cost at one end, and of course, make sure that our business is robust and in safe hands. Reports, in fact, indicating that unintentional data sharing by employees is a far greater risk than intentionally leaking of data and information. And I see you're agreeing with that, Meena. You're absolutely right. And I speak from not just my experience with my various startups, but also the companies on whose boards I sit, that data security, um, ensuring people understand and follow the norms is the most difficult thing. And in one of the companies, uh, we sent out an email to all the employees, um, which looks like it has come from that company, uh, and just to test, to see how people behave, and ask them to share something. 50% of people <laughs> <laughs> fell for it. It's really, and this is a company which does a lot of uh, training and constant retraining and all that still people just fall for it. So, we just don't realize how insidious this problem of uh, um, unintentional data leakages and that requires a huge amount of work. Yeah. Thank you for that. I think uh, we can perhaps take in some questions from our audience. I see a lot of hands going up. Yes, right there at the back, please. Go ahead. If you can tell us whom the question is being addressed to. Yeah, actually, the question is for anybody. My name is Advait Kurlekar. I'm a consultant. question is, uh, uh, what is the effect on the mental health or mental well-being of your employees that you've seen in the last two years? And more importantly, what have you done about it? And a second quick question is, is the new normal slowly going back to the old normal? Because you mentioned about 80-85% companies are back, back to office. Thank you. So it's a, I'm glad you brought that up and uh, this is uh, not just for the employees but for the entrepreneurs as well. Then the people who are setting up the businesses, small or big, uh, old gen, new gen, whatever you have, uh, the, this period has been extremely trying and not just because of COVID and just immediately on the back of COVID now we are seeing a lot of 
churn in the whole tech-led businesses, some IPOs, all kinds of things is constantly churning. So there is a lot of stress on the entrepreneur. And um, I think first and foremost as entrepreneurs, each of us has to take some time out for ourselves and see that we are investing in our physical health because that leads to better mental health, physical health, sleep, leading to better uh, equanimity, perhaps invest in our own spiritual growth, perhaps important to look at practices such as meditation so that you can remain a little centered when the whole world is going bonkers around you. Now that said, the second part of course is about the mental health of our employees which um, like um, all of us mentioned during this period there has been huge amount of burnout and, um, and doubling down and providing them support first acknowledging it giving a space for people to share their challenges and then finding ways to address all the three are uh, super important. Perhaps Nathan may have something to add to that. Thank you, Meena. I was just uh, sitting on the edge of my seat wanting to share. I think um, the words that you mentioned, very evocative. Couple of things. I, I think the moment we acknowledge to ourselves that it is okay not to be okay and express it, that's the first thing. I mean, all of us are type A people. We think we are so macho. This cannot happen to us. I think when we show our vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities just not to ourselves, to people around, then we just normalize the whole thing. So what work can we do? Beyond meditation, beyond all this, I think there are a few things that we introduced. First, um, we started to respect the lunch hour much more. So we say, no meeting between one and two. Of course, you're serving a client, we understand all that, but that is your time, please make sure that you don't impinge on that. Like that, you could even say, for a certain time of the evening, no calls beyond this. Of course, I, I fully understand the pressures that we have, but eking out a certain part of your, your time makes it very important. We introduced one more very simple one. We said, sometimes when people speak, we don't listen very well. This is, when people speak, we only listen to what is being said. We don't listen to what is not said, the ankahi. So we started to spend more time with people to help them understand the ankahi. Gestures. Because when you're on a Zoom call, you don't understand gestures because it doesn't happen. So we supplemented that with, with, a, with a very simple one called each one reach one. We designated 15 minutes of, a, of time in a week. We said all you have to do is call up uh, Meena Ajit. Hey Meena Ajit, how are you? How are you doing? How are things? That is all. And there would be a response. And from that response, if you can make out, would you want to share more, this, that? You at least knew that you had people who are around you. Mental health is the single most important thing which we focused on. By the way, all mental health starts, and the, the way that we can address it for our employees starts with us, people in this room. We started a program where we sensitized people at the very top for our organization, making sure that we understand our own pressures and what pressures we could bring on people who are working under us. So formal programs were launched, and of course, slew of work of how other people have done better with it. The more people talk to each other, understand one another, that itself lessens it. Ajit? So just to add to that, right, I think um, one thing that uh, within our teams we've tried and got people to be more okay with is just allowing people to take time off without a reason. Yeah. Uh, it is not something that culturally, I think Indians, I don't think we as Indians are culturally being attuned to that and it's hard for managers to also sort of get get to that answer, right? Uh, so one of the things that actually, um, you know, we saw happening negatively through the COVID period was actually the at the extreme of it where people would work through a Saturday, a Saturday, exactly. and pretty much you know, through 15 days and then would suddenly come and say that, you know, I don't want to work for the next three days. They didn't have a reason to give and it was absolutely fine for them not to have a reason because it was just burnout. It, that, and that's what was leading to mental stress. So just 
normalizing that that it's okay for people to take time off without a reason um, i think is important um, you know pre covid post covid but i think it remains as important right um, to i think the first part of the question about you know is the new normal the old normal i don't think so i don't think we ever go back to the old normal i think a few things have now become par for the course right um i would find it very hard to run a team where i will ex- where i would expect everybody to come in every day of the working week uh, i don't think people want to do that i don't think i don't think managers and managers are also employees at a, at a level so i don't think managers also want to do that they want to have that flexibility right uh, geographically i spoke about what's changed um and you know it's changed for many companies and i don't think we're going back on many of those things uh, so you know the new normal is different it is certainly not what happened during the covid period right which was an extreme okay but neither is it going back to what it was before it Great. Yeah, I think can I just sure. borrow a, so yeah almost six we we introduced six days additional leave no questions asked you can take that any time but that's not important we are monitoring how many people actually take it i think this is the single most important thing so a lot of takeaways for our audience uh, the clock is showing we have less than a minute any questions maybe from yeah go ahead my name is mehul prambat i uh, i have my it firm so majority tech people when we hire they tend to take a offer letter but they then don't turn up on the date of joining that's the major challenge what we are facing at this moment and when we speak to a consultants <laughs> i think it's a general one <laughs> and the uh, when i speak to consultant they are saying they are taking the offer letters they are going to a different tan companies and that's the biggest challenge if uh, anyone can throw a last some light on this would be best Uh, my name is mehul prambhu sure. thank you so if you find an answer to that please let me know <laughs> <laughs> so i think we just have to live with some of these things we got to get a little sharper we got to understand what these motivations are and i think in each person we got to personalize it sometimes we think that everybody works the same way we've got to be looking at mass working customization every person is an individual today they are having different needs the day we understand that people are not looking for another 30 pieces of silver but they're looking something beyond that you don't have we are still struggling and and by the way we, we we've done everything including people chasing those people up the wall i hope you will come on monday and monday of course on sunday they do some extra yagya at home hoping that they will turn up Anyway. That's our time and we've got a reminder as well to wrap up. Thank you so much Meena, Nadan, Ajit. Thank you to our audience today for being so engaged. Thank you.